I'm Eric Brynjolfsson. I'm a professor at Stanford University and the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. My research focuses on the effects of AI and other digital technologies on work, employment, and the economy. We are in a period of an explosive growth in the capabilities of AI. Large language models on more broadly generative AI. At Stanford, we have a group focusing on what we call foundation models have become enormously more powerful just in recent past couple of years, even the past couple of months. And it's exceeded my expectations. And I talked to the people developing the tools, it's even exceeded their expectations. So we are able to solve all sorts of problems that previously only humans could solve in terms of writing pretty good prose, fiction, poetry, songs, also generating images. Many of uh, your listeners will have played with tools like Dolly. And uh, it can generate other things, too. That some of these related technologies can be used to um, synthesize proteins and generate 3D drawings and write code, computer code. Um, and so there's quite a remarkable flourishing of new capabilities in recent years. It turns out that, that they took a very simple idea which is that in a large language model, what you simply do is take a set of words and you try to predict what the next word or the next few words are going to be. And there's a lot of training data you can use. You can look at all the books that have been written, all the text in Wikipedia on the web. So there's a lot of training data to see, given this sequence of words, what's the next likely sequence of words. And the difference is they've just made much, much larger models to do that. Statistically, huge models with hundreds of billions of parameters, and they trained it with enormous amounts of data. And when it did this, it got to be pretty good at, at uh, predicting and generating new t the next plausible word. And in order to do that, it seems like it kind of had to, I hate to use the word understand, but it had to have some inkling of what's going on in relationships. It has to know a little bit about geography. It has to know a little bit about relationships. It has to know a little bit about other concepts in order to predict what word would come next. If you say you're driving south from San Francisco to Palo Alto, then it starts knowing something about the distance. And if you're predicting what would come next, you have to know something about space and time, etc. And so these models have this knowledge in there and when you start asking them questions, it turns out that it can give you back some of the knowledge that it has absorbed from all these books and from Wikipedia and these other sources. Statistically predicting a plausible next word, it doesn't mean it's the true actual next word. Um, there's something, a dial you can turn, call the, they call it the temperature, which says whether it picks the next word that's very likely or moderately likely or somewhat unlikely. And so it, it randomizes a little bit in terms of which words it's going to show. Um, and just like a human, it, it can kind of hallucinate and think, well, this seems plausible, but it's not necessarily the, the underlying true fact that it got from somewhere. Um, this can be kind of fun if you're writing fiction or poetry and making metaphors. Um, it can be very counterproductive if you really need a factual answer to something. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of people working right now to be able to tune these models and, and enhance them in such a way that you're more likely to get a true answer when you really need one. But for now, I would be very cautious in using them. Well, the business applications are enormous, and they'll certainly be used in marketing, and they already are being used in, in, in copywriting. Uh, they're being used in uh, law and helping people write legal briefs. Um, I already mentioned writing stories, helping with essays. They can take large bodies of text and summarize them. Um, but I'm not sure worried is, is the right attitude. I think people should be excited that we are going to have these tools to help us do work much more efficiently and more effectively. In almost all cases, it's going to be important to keep a human in the loop. Um, you want to have, because as you mentioned earlier, sometimes they don't give accurate answers and sometimes not the ones you're really looking for. So it'll be very important to have a person steering them and checking them and working with them. And people are going to get better and better at using these tools to create better ad copy than they ever created before, more convincing marketing, uh, better poetry, more interesting songs, more persuasive essays. This can be done with these tools in ways that couldn't have been done before. So uh, my mindset is not to fear these tools, but to embrace them and think about how can we use these tools to do our jobs better.
It, you can certainly use it in ways that you produce similar content with less labor and have fewer people, or you can produce better content, or you can produce more content for more people. Uh, you can use it in ways where humans are very involved in the creation or where humans are not so involved. These choices will make a big difference in terms of the ultimate shape of society, the ultimate economic implications. I'm an economist, and as I look at these technologies more closely, I've come to the conclusion that we have to be very thoughtful and careful about how we design the systems, how we implement them, and what incentives we have for rolling them out. In particular, when we make the tools that are very similar to human capabilities, that imitate humans, they're likely to replace human labor and drive down wages. If we make the tools different and they have capabilities that most humans don't have, and they're meant to have humans in the loop so they extend our capabilities, so they allow us to do new things, then they're likely to drive up wages and create more widely shared prosperity. And that's why I've written a paper I call it The Turing Trap, which basically argues that we have spent too much emphasis on trying to make machines that imitate humans and not enough on extending it. Well, well, let me be clear. Sometimes it is good to save labor, and there's certain some very boring tasks that we'd like to have replaced. Um, but most of us would like a society where wealth is widely shared, where lots of people are contributing, where there's not just a few billionaires that have all the uh, uh, control of everything that's produced in the economy. So if we want to create a world where there's widely shared prosperity, uh, we need to change the incentives for three different groups of people, technologists, uh, managers and entrepreneurs, and thirdly, policymakers. Let me walk through each of them in turn. Technologists right now, many of them have been captured by this very evocative vision of making machines that imitate humans. Alan Turing, in 1950, proposed something he called the Turing Test, and the goal of it was to make a machine that was so similar to a human that you couldn't tell the difference between the two. And he argued that if you could make a machine that perfectly imitated a human, it would pass the Turing test and therefore be considered intelligent. And many of my colleagues are working implicitly or explicitly at tools that imitate humans very closely. I see that that's a beautiful, exciting vision, and it would help us free us up from a lot of labor. But as I mentioned earlier, it also leads to a more concentration of wealth. So the first thing we need to do is persuade more technologists to think about taking their brilliance and focusing it on making tools that enhance us rather than replace us. For instance, uh, machines can do many things that we can't do. Uh, they can see x-rays, they can see, hear ultrasound, uh, they can manipulate things at the nanoscale, they can do so many things that are impossible for me to do. When they play chess, they use very different techni techniques or Go or any other game than what humans do. Uh, and I would like to push further on using those new capabilities so we go beyond what we used to be able to do. And I'd just see more technologists do that. For the managers, many of them are focused on saving labor. But when I teach my business school students or when I consult with executives, I'm encouraging more of them to think, what are some new products and services that we can create that we never created before? Don't simply focus on taking the same business model, the same goods and services, and taking the labor out. There's value in that, no question. But there's much more value in creating new goods and services, and in fact, if all we had ever done was simply do the same thing but more cheaply, our living standards wouldn't be very high. Imagine if Daedalus, one of the first mythological inventors of robots uh, 2,500 years ago, had simply used his tool to imitate what the Greeks were doing 2,500 years ago, and the robots were making clay pots and chariots, and if someone got sick, they would burn incense. Sure, there would be no more need for work, so that's nice, but our living standards wouldn't be much higher than the ancient Greeks. Most of the value has come from inventing new things, and it takes a little more creativity to invent something new than to simply replace it with a cheaper uh, machine. Um, but managers who put the effort in to uh, creating those new goods and services ultimately create more value for themselves, for shareholders, and for all society. In the United States and most countries, uh, policymakers have really put a lot of incentives towards favoring capital over labor. 
For instance, in the United States, tax rates on labor are about twice as high as tax rates on capital, and there are special incentives for investment and so forth. Now, I don't see any logical reason why an entrepreneur who has a business model that employs a lot of people should end up paying a lot more taxes to the government than an entrepreneur that employs few people but a lot of machines. But that's the way the tax code currently is. It doesn't have to be that way. In fact, as recently as 1986, taxes on capital labor were exactly even in the United States. And if you had more of an even treatment, then you wouldn't be pushing people towards, you wouldn't be pushing entrepreneurs and investors towards replacing people with machines. And one of the first rules of taxes off, off, one of the first rules of taxes is that whatever you tax more, you get less of. So if we're, we're taxing uh, labor and workers getting income and taxing la capital less, we're going to get fewer workers and more um, business models that focus on capital. So all three of those groups, technologists, uh, managers and entrepreneurs, and policymakers currently have skewed incentives that focus us a little too much on replacing humans and not enough on augmenting and extending human capabilities. One of my goals in the coming year is to educate more people about what I call the Turing trap, this trap we fall into when we replace workers with machines and the workers get less power and then they're not able to change the system in a way that we create more widely shared prosperity. I don't think it's automatic that we'll manage this transition, and I do think it's possible we'll have a lot of labor unrest. And the reason I call it the Turing Trap is that if you do end up um, using machines to replace workers, then you drive down their wages, they have less economic power, they have less bargaining power, and usually when they have less economic power, they're going to have less political power as well. And so you could end up in a bad equilibrium where a lot of people are left out and they don't have any way of changing the system and the people with the power have no real incentive to help the other group, maybe out of kindness, but they have no, no economic incentive to do so. So this could be a pretty bad equilibrium. That's why we need to work hard starting now while we still have democracy, while we still have somewhat shared prosperity, so we don't end up in that trap, that bad equilibrium where most people are powerless and have little economic benefit. Um, I do think both outcomes are possible, so I'm optimistic that if we act now, we will be able to use these amazing technologies to enhance people and to create new goods and services and to avoid the turning trap. But I want to caution, it's not automatic, and if we do it wrong, the next 10 years could be very rocky indeed. Over the past 10 years, um, wages have diverged a lot in the United States. People with a high school education have lower real wages. We also have seen what we call deaths from despair, alcohol, alcoholism, suicide, drug abuse. They've gone up among those less educated workers who have less economic bargaining power. Meanwhile, wages have gone up for more educated people. So there's been a divergence there in lifespans and in wages. Um, so that's not an outcome most of us are happy to see. And I don't think it's inevitable. I think we need to make some choices with our tax code and with the decisions of managers, the decision of technologists to try to reverse that trend and use the technology to create widely shared prosperity. The list of jobs that are innately human seems to be rapidly changing. And I'll be uh, frank, um, in 2014, Andrew McAfee and I, when we wrote The Second Machine Age, we had a vision of what kinds of things were likely to be affected first, uh, routine information processing jobs, some of the low-end information work, and we thought that more creative work would be difficult to automate, whether it's uh, writing a novel or doing uh, uh, scientific experiments or uh, coming up with an entrepreneurial venture or being a CEO. Now we're finding with some of these large language models, these generative models, that some of that work that we thought was very creative actually can be done by machines. On the other hand, it's a paradox that some things that, we, that seem easy, you know, picking a blueberry off a bush or walking up a set of stairs, uh, buttoning a shirt, things that maybe a five-year-old can do pretty easily um, are very, very difficult to teach machines how to do. Um, so we have to be um, uh, humble about estimating which tasks will be done next. Um, and 
frankly, even the researchers who are working in these areas are sometimes surprised when the machines are able to do something that they didn't expect or conversely have great difficulty, say like with driving self-driving cars, more than they anticipated when they first started on the project.